Hello, I'm Gary Stevens, and welcome to the History in the Bible podcast. All the history, in all the books, in all the Bibles. Episode 1.49, The Assyrian Storm. In the last episode of the History in the Bible, I took time off from the political histories of the two kingdoms to tell the stories of the first two prophets who get their own books, Amos and Hosea. The next prophet we will meet is Isaiah, the first superstar prophet. At this point in our story, the Assyrians march to centre stage in all their grisly glory. Let's set the background to the final decades of the Kingdom of Israel. The Assyrians had spent a generation preoccupied with threats to their north. King Tiglath-Pileser III, Tukulti Apal Ashara, launched a highly successful program of Assyrian expansion and consolidation. He contained the ambitions of the Kingdom of Uratu. He campaigned along the Mediterranean coast in an attempt to control the trade routes between Egypt, Anatolia and the Aegean. The Assyrians never sought friends. They wanted components they could incorporate into their imperial economic system for their own benefit. They were Walmart with an army. I was going to make some modern comparisons, but I'll forbear. In an age where eye-gouging was the international standard penalty, For parking your chariot in a disabled zone, the Assyrians were feared for ruthless cruelty. Assyrian palaces were decorated with reliefs of gruesome battle scenes. The Assyrians preferred to make client states of their conquered peoples. It saved money and Assyrian blood. It preserved the client state intact to serve its function as part of the Assyrian trading network. The client paid an annual tribute as part of the Assyrian protection racket and agreed to support Assyrian military operations. In return, the Assyrians left the client's government and social structures intact. Kingdoms and cities who refused to submit were subject to the full force of the Assyrian army. A heavier tribute was imposed, and often an Assyrian proconsul was installed. Sometimes the existing leaders were left in place. Those who failed to pay their annual tribute were considered to be in rebellion. They were crushed mercilessly, lost their autonomy, and incorporated into the empire as a province. The elites were deported and settled elsewhere. In turn, foreigners would be brought in to resettle the depopulated province. Not that the Assyrian path to empire was smooth. Oh no. Uprisings were common in the conquered territories, Babylon especially. In Assyria itself, pretenders to the throne emerged with aggravating regularity. The kingdoms of the Levant, Israel, Aram Damascus, Moab and Ammon, were annoyingly resilient, as the Bible records. To the south, Egypt revived and sought to reassert its dominance over the long-lost provinces of Canaan. With the 25th dynasty, a house from Sudan that we call the Kushites, the Egyptians started marching north, with a vigour unknown since the Bronze Age collapse. Many Hebrews looked to the Kushite dynasty to support them against the rapidly growing power of Assyria. Their hopes came to naught, although the Kushites constantly meddled, in Levantine affairs. The Kushites were eventually met and easily defeated by the Assyrians, who extinguished the dynasty 120 years after its foundation, in 663 BC. In an unusual reversal of traditional Assyrian policy, the Assyrian king Ashurbanipal resolved to make a friend of the Egyptians, rather than just cutting their heads off. He established the last native dynasty of Egypt, the 26th. 
That dynasty reigned until its conquest by the Persians in 525 BC, when Egypt was annexed to the Persian Empire. The little nations of the Levant were just bit players in the diplomatic struggle between the two superstates. All these tiny kingdoms, Israel, Judah, Moab, Edom, Ammon, Aram Damascus, the Phoenicians, had their own petty jealousies with their neighbours and hoped to exploit their friendships with the great powers to their own benefit and the destruction of their enemies. The regional power of Aram Damascus lay between Assyria and Israel. When Assyria was occupied elsewhere to the north or east, as it often was for decades, Aram Damascus would hammer Israel, frequently reducing its power to just the city of Samaria. Israel's house of Jehu had very good reason to befriend Assyria. But to befriend Assyria was to step into the lion's jaw. Those in Israel and Judah who wanted to accommodate Assyrian policies did so knowing that they would face burdens, but at least their countries would survive. They rightly feared the horrendous consequences that followed rebellion. They also knew that by allying with Assyria, they could counterbalance the ever-present threat from Aram Damascus. But there were always others, more hopeful, who tried to patch together coalitions against Assyria with their fellow small states, usually with the belief that the Egyptians would come to their rescue with a large army or two. It didn't work, of course. The Egyptians proved weak and fickle, the Assyrians strong and relentless. In 722 BC, the Assyrians annihilated the northern kingdom of Israel, deporting its ten tribes into oblivion. Or maybe not. Let's get back to the last years of Israel. To the frustration of the prophets Amos and Hosea, who had predicted otherwise, King Jeroboam II of Israel, of the house of Jehu, died a peaceful death in about 748 BC. Before we follow the dismal fate of the kingdom of Israel, we have to catch up on the events in the kingdom of Judah, while Jeroboam was running Israel through four peaceful decades. In episode 1.47, we left the kingdom of Judah at the death of King Amaziah in 786 BC. His attempted invasion of Israel had gone disastrously wrong 13 years earlier. He was captured by the house of Jehu and his capital sacked, but he was allowed to remain on the throne. Uzziah, Uzziah, known as Azariah in Chronicles, followed his father Amaziah on the throne of Judah in 785 BC, at the age of 16 years. I'll call him Uzziah because another character named Azariah has a significant role to play later. Kings dismisses the king in an uninformative seven verses. Chronicles is much more expansive, portraying him as a benign and powerful ruler. As usual in the chronicler's scheme, all the good things Uzziah did happened in the first part of his reign, and all the bad in the second part. Quote, 2 Chronicles 26.4 Uzziah did what was pleasing to the Lord, During the time he worshipped the Lord, God made him prosper. He went forth to fight the Philistines. The Ammonites paid tribute to Uzziah, and his fame spread to the approaches of Egypt. Uzziah built towers in Jerusalem and fortified them. He had much cattle, and farmers in the foothills and on the plain, and vine dressers in the mountains and on the fertile lands, for he loved the soil. Uzziah had an army of warriors, a battle-ready force. Uzziah provided them, the whole army, with shields and spears and helmets and mail and bows and sling stones. He made clever devices in Jerusalem, set on the towers and the corners, for shooting arrows and large stones. His fame spread far, for he was helped wonderfully, and he became strong. End quote. 
The first part of Isaiah's reign is depicted as one of peace and prosperity, with a happy relationship with Jeroboam II's Israel. The turning point was Uzziah's attempt to assume a priestly role. That is never a good idea. In the following passage from Chronicles, he is confronted by the priest Azariah. Quote, 2 Chronicles 26, 16. When he was strong, Uzziah grew so arrogant he acted corruptly. He trespassed against his God by entering the temple of the Lord to offer incense on the incense altar. The priest Azariah followed him, and confronting King Uzziah, said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to offer incense to the Lord, but for the Aaronite priests. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have trespassed. Uzziah, holding the censer and ready to burn incense, got angry. But as he got angry with the priests, leprosy broke out on his forehead in front of the priests, beside the incense altar. When the chief priest Azariah looked at him, his forehead was leprous, so they rushed him out of there. He too made haste to get out, for the Lord had struck him with a plague. King Uzziah was a leper until the day of his death. He lived in isolated quarters as a leper, for he was cut off from the house of the Lord, while Jotham his son was in charge of the king's house and governed the people of the land. End quote. The chronology and circumstances are confused. That confusion starts with the reigns of Uzziah's father Amaziah and his grandfather Joash. Kings holds that Joash reigned 40 years, Amaziah reigned for 29, and Uzziah for 52. Their combined reigns of 121 years are impossible to reconcile with Assyrian records and the synchronisms with the kings of Israel. Amaziah had been taken captive after his ill-conceived war against Israel. We do not know the length of Amaziah's captivity, nor how the government in Judah was run in his absence. We do not know when Amaziah was killed, but the Bible clearly says it was in unpleasant circumstances. The easiest way out of the problem is to assume that the analysts overlapped Uzziah's leprous years with those of his son Jotham, Yotam, and grandson Ahaz, Ahaz. Another way to make sense of the inconsistent chronologies we have is to assume that Amaziah of Judah lived for many years as a captive in Israel, and the analysts continued to record those years as part of his reign. But in Judah, his son Uzziah was placed on the throne, and the years of his reign overlapped those recorded for his captive father. Other scholars have suggested that Uzziah and his father were co-kings for 25 years. Whenever it happened, Uzziah was followed by his son Yatam. The Book of Kings has a typical summation for the reign of a king it did not consider important. At this point, Kings introduces two new personalities into the biblical story. King Perkar of Israel and Retzin of Aram Damascus. Quote, 2 Kings 15.32 In the second year of King Perkar of Israel, Yotam, son of King Uzziah of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. He did what was pleasing to the Lord, just as his father Uzziah had done. However, the shrines were not removed. The people continued to sacrifice and to make offerings at the shrines. It was he who built the upper gate of the house of the Lord. The other events of Yotam's reign and all his actions are recorded in the annals of the kings of Judah. In those days the Lord began to incite King Ratzin of Aram and Perkar against Judah. Yotam slept with his fathers, and he was buried with his fathers in the city of his ancestor David. End quote. The chronicler is much happier with the king. Quote, Second Chronicles 
27.2 Yotam did what was pleasing to the Lord, just as his father Uzziah had done. But he did not enter the temple of the Lord. However, the people still acted corruptly. He built towns in the hill country of Judah, and in the woods he built fortresses and towers. Moreover, he fought with the king of the Ammonites and overcame them. The Ammonites gave him that year a hundred talents of silver, and ten thousand core of wheat, and another ten thousand of barley. Yotam was strong because he maintained a faithful course before the Lord his God. End quote. It is with the dating of Yotam's reign that scholars disagree most passionately. All the niggling discrepancies that began with the dating of Yotam's great-grandfather Joash culminate in the chronological chaos that is Yotam. His accession is placed anywhere between 759 and 740 BC, and his death anywhere between 744 and 732 BC. Perhaps he reigned for seven years, or sixteen. As I mentioned in episode 1.42, I'm going with the scholars Miller and Hayes here. Yotam came to the throne in 759 BC, and spent a happy fifteen years there, until his death in 744 BC. I have a great table at my site www.historyinthebible.com that compares all the major scholarly dating systems for the reigns of the kings of Israel and Judah. With the death of Yotam of Judah in 744 BC, we have caught up with Israel as it was at the death of Jeroboam II. Let us recount the final sad 25 years of Israel's history. Jeroboam II was succeeded by his son Zechariah, or Zechariah, Zechariah, in 747 BC, but not for long. Quote, 2 Kings 15.8 Zechariah, son of Jeroboam, became king over Israel in Samaria for six months. He did what was displeasing to the Lord, as his fathers had done. He did not depart from the sins which Jeroboam had caused Israel to commit. Shalom, Shalom conspired against him, and struck him down before the people and killed him, and succeeded him as king. This was in accord with the word that the Lord had spoken to Jehu. Four generations of your descendants shall occupy the throne of Israel. And so it came about. End quote. The house of Jehu had always been dutiful vassals of Assyria, since the day that Shalmaneser III had placed his foot on Jehu's neck a hundred and ten years before. It is quite possible that Shalom was the candidate of those who wanted to break free from the imperial bonds. Shalom lasted but a single month until overthrown by one Menahem, Menahem, who marched against him from the first capital of Israel, Terzah, established after the death of Solomon. Kings records only one significant event for Menahem, an event confirmed by Assyrian records. Quote, 2 Kings 15.19 King Paul, that's Tiglath-Pileser III, of Assyria invaded the land. And Menahem gave Paul a thousand talents of silver, that Menahem might support him and strengthen his hold on the kingdom. Menahem exacted the money from Israel. Every man of means had to pay 50 shekels of silver for the king of Assyria. The king of Assyria withdrew and did not remain in the land. End quote. After extracting their tribute, the Assyrians kept Menahem on the throne for 10 years. We have no idea who Menahem was. All we know is that both Shalom and Menahem had chosen the wrong side of a history by opposing Assyria. They decided to take on the greatest warrior king in Assyrian history, Tiglath-Pileser III. Well done, chaps. In his inscriptions, Tiglath-Pileser III 
uses an unusual description for Menahem. In their long history, the Assyrians usually called Israel Bit Omri, House of Omri. But the Assyrian king refers to him as Menahem of the city of Samaria. This might indicate that Menahem controlled only Samaria and its surrounds in the hill country, the areas of the tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim. Perhaps he lost to the Aramaeans all the land of the Gilead across the Jordan and Galilee to the north. Menahem was succeeded by his son Pekahior in 736 BC. In a brief two verses, the Book of Kings reports that Pekahior was killed by one Perka. In English, the two kings have the alarmingly similar names of Pekahiah and Pekah. So I will use the Hebrew pronunciations to remove confusion, no doubt to the consternation of my Hebrew-speaking listeners. Perkah was supported by the tribe of Gad, outside Canaan, east of the Jordan, in the region called the Gilead. Perkar reigned for perhaps a year. It is easy to see why those in the Gilead would reject Menahem's son, Pekahior. No one likes paying tribute to the Assyrians. The catalyst may have been a sense among the Transjordanians that the house of Menahem, safe in the city of Samaria, had abandoned them. We know from Assyrian tribute records that Menahem was ruling no later than 738 BC, and that the last king of Israel, Hoshea, was on the throne in 730 BC, a mere eight years later. Second Kings says that the two intervening monarchs, Pekahior and Perka, ruled for a total of 22 years. We have a problem. Most just reduce Perka's reign but there is another way to account for the discrepancy. Perkar's revolt was probably supported by King Retzin of Damascus. Second Kings records that Perkar, acting as some sort of bandit, had cooperated with Retzin in raiding Judah since Yotam's time, 15 years before. If the Book of Kings is taking the start of Perkar's reign from those times, it would make sense of the 22 years the book attributes to him. The best guess we can make is that Perkar became king in 734 BC and reigned for three years. The Assyrians under Tiglath-Pileser III were extending their control throughout the region. Aram Damascus was next on their list, and surely Israel could not be far behind. Perkar quickly entered into a coalition with Aram Damascus against the Assyrians, reversing the pro-Assyrian policies of his two predecessors. No doubt Perkar expected King Ahaz of Judah to join his coalition against the Assyrians. After all, Judah had dutifully followed the Israelite lead since the days of Omri, 140 years before. King Ahaz had other ideas. He is also known as Jehoahaz, Jehoahaz. At the age of 20, he followed his father Yotam onto the throne of the southern kingdom in 743 BC. I said earlier that one way to make sense of the chronology of the Judean kings as depicted in the Book of Kings is to assume that Ahaz's leprous grandfather, Uzziah, was still alive in the following reigns. If so, Uzziah survived six years into Ahaz's reign and must have had some influence on Judean affairs. The biblical authors describe Ahaz with unadorned loathing. Here is the book of Kings. Quote, 2 Kings 16.1 In the seventeenth year of Perkah, Ahaz, son of King Yotam of Judah, became king. He did not do what was pleasing to the Lord his God, as his ancestor David had done, but followed the ways of the kings of Israel. He even consigned his son to the fire, in the abhorrent fashion of the nations, which the Lord had dispossessed before the Israelites. He sacrificed and made offerings at the shrines, on the hills, and under every leafy tree. End quote. And here is Chronicles. Quote, 
2 Chronicles 28.1 Ahaz was twenty years old when he became king. Unlike David his father, he did not do what was right in the eyes of Yahweh. He followed the ways of the kings of Israel and also made idols for worshipping the Baals. He burned sacrifices in the valley of Ben-Hanom and sacrificed his children in the fire, engaging in the detestable practices of the nations Yahweh had driven out before the Israelites. He offered sacrifices and burned incense at the high places, on the hilltops and under every spreading tree. End quote. Child sacrifice, woo-hoo-hoo. Ahaz of Judah was hard-pressed on all sides. The Edomites and Philistines were not only raiding, but taking villages. Israel and Aram Damascus were insisting that he join them against Assyria. Now, most Judeans probably thought that was a grand idea. A coalition of Levantine states had beaten off the Assyrians in the time of King Ahab of Israel, a century before. Surely it would work again. When Ahaz begged off, Perkar of Israel and Retzin of Aram Damascus moved against him in an attempt to secure their flanks. Chronicles hints that an assassination attempt was made on Ahaz. We follow the plight of King Ahaz in the next episode of the History in the Bible. Thanks for listening.